Our message this evening is entitled Revelations 1000 Years. You know, it's amazing the human imagination as it is seen in the, uh, the revolution or the innovative world of CGI. But tonight, we're going to look through the prophetic lens of God's prophetic word. And God's going to show us and draw aside in the curtain of what's going to happen to everyone that's ever lived in this world. And so we turn to the subject of the millennium. Now, there are many people that believe today we're coming to some golden age of millennial peace in which everyone is going to be converted in this great utopia of the future here on earth. Now, I wish that could be a true picture, but it's the exact opposite, really, of what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in the last days, evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceived and being deceived. Jesus said himself, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And so this whole idea of a temporal millennium on this earth is just a grand delusion tonight. And we're not interested in dreams and fancies in theories. We want to know the facts from the Bible of what's going to happen in the end of time and eventually to everyone that's ever lived in this world. Now, many of you know the word millennium is not even found in the Bible at all. It comes from two Latin words, milli meaning a thousand and annum meaning a year. Now, we do find the truth of the millennium in the Bible. And this subject is almost always clustered and focused on the subject of the resurrection of the dead. And we've learned that there are really two general resurrections spoken of in the Bible. So let's go now to John chapter 5 as we read what Jesus said in regarding these two general resurrections. Now, having said that, there are some special ones that have taken place. We know that when Jesus resurrected, the Bible says many that were sleeping in the graves came up after his resurrection, appeared unto many in the city of Jerusalem. So there was a special resurrection. But I'm talking about the two general resurrections spoken of here. So John chapter 5, beginning now in verse 28 and verse 29. Notice Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in thee which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, there it is, the two general resurrections spoken of here. He said the time is coming when the righteous will come out of their graves. This is called the resurrection of life. And the time will come when the wicked will come out of their graves. And this is called the resurrection of damnation. Now, this is not the only place the Bible speaks about this. Let's go now to Revelation chapter 20. We're going to spend most of our time in this chapter tonight. So, Revelation now chapter 20. And we'll begin reading here in verse 6. Revelation 20, verse 6, the revelator says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Notice something, it does say, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. No wicked person, no bad person, no lost person has any part in this resurrection. Blessed and holy is he, the Bible says. But then it goes on to say something else. It says that they would reign with him for the 1,000 years. In other words, this resurrection right here spoken of begins the millennium. Did you get that? It says they come out of their graves and they reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Now, once again, this is not the only place the Bible speaks about this time period. Look at Revelation chapter 20 and notice verse 4. This verse is describing the class that um, are worshiping the beast. And then it goes on to talk about those who are not worshiping the beast and taking his mark. And then it says here, which had not worshiped the beast, the latter part of verse 4, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? For the 1,000 years. Once again, it's the saints, friends. It's not the class that take the mark. They're not worshiping the beast. It says they're following Jesus, and they would reign with him for 1,000 years. Now, you're probably thinking right now, but what about the lost? What about the, the unsaved? What's going to happen to them? Now let's look now at verse 5, and we're plainly told. It says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Well, that would have to be the wicked, wouldn't it? That would be the lost. They remain in their graves, according to Jesus. They are reserved there unto the resurrection of damnation. Now what do we have at this point? We're going to make this as clear as possible. We have a 1,000 year period, right? We have a resurrection at the beginning of the 1,000 years. We have a resurrection at the end of the 1,000 years. Now the question is this. What event actually begins the 1,000 years? When does it actually happen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's read it. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we've read this verse many times, we're going to read it again. And here the Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Thessalonica, beginning in verse 16, this is what he says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Remember that? In Revelation 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Here it says, The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so the millennium begins when Jesus comes the second time, right? He breaks the clouds of blue with all the holy angels of heaven. He comes in all of his glory. And I tell you what, friends, when he comes the second time, there will be four classes of people that he must deal with. Think about it. The righteous who are living and the righteous who are dead, right? The wicked who are living and the wicked who are dead. And by the way, this will encompass all of humanity. Everyone that's ever had the breath of life that's lived in this world will fall under one of these four categories. The righteous living, righteous dead, wicked living, and the wicked dead. So let's talk about the righteous who are already in their graves when Jesus comes again. Now the Bible's clear, right? What's going to happen to them? It says the dead in Christ shall what? They shall rise. They're sleeping in the graves. They're going to wake up to immortality. They're going to come out of the graves. And the Bible says they're going to meet Jesus in the air. That's what clearly it teaches. It's called the resurrection of life. But what about the righteous who are alive? What's going to happen to the righteous who are alive? Now back to that quickly. In the book of Isaiah 20, verse 19, the Bible says there, Awake ye that sleep in the dust of the earth, and the dead shall cast out, come out of the earth, because the Bible says Jesus has come. In fact, the righteous will look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. We will indeed rejoice in his salvation. Can you say amen? And so we're looking here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 17, and verse 18. And so the Bible clearly tells us that when the righteous are on the earth and Jesus comes, instantaneously they will be changed in a twig of an eye. This mortal shall put on immortality. They're not going to come up with the same decrepit bodies that uh, the, 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 the dead went into their graves with, right? They're going to come up with immortality. In fact, the Bible says our bodies will be fashioned or made like unto his glorious body. You can read that, by the way, in the book of Philippians chapter 3. So we're going to be just like Christ as he resurrected as well. Now, before we get to the, um, the wicked, what's going to happen when Jesus comes to the wicked, let's ask this question. Where will the righteous go after Jesus comes again? Oh, you can hear so many reports out there, so many personal interpretations. I heard the story that one minister believed and he taught that when Jesus comes again, he's going to take the righteous into the air and bring them over a mountain and drop them back down in the world again. Friends, is that what the Bible teaches? No, not at all. In fact, Jesus told us where we're going. In John chapter 14, Verse 1 through 3, Jesus said himself, uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, he said, Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, he said, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive into myself that where I am, there you may be also. Friends, pass the sun, moon, and stars to the third heaven where God currently resides right now. That's where the saints will go for the 1,000 years. Now back to the wicked who are actually in their graves. Now when Jesus comes, the righteous have been taken to heaven with him, right? So when Jesus comes, the wicked who are already dead, what's going to happen to them? We just read it in Revelation 20 and verse 5, or 20 verse 5. They remain in their graves until after the 1,000 years so they're sleeping, they're reserved there, waiting their resurrection at the end of the millennium. But what about the wicked who are living when Jesus comes? What's going to happen to them? Now, you know what the Bible says. Look at 2 Thessalonians now, chapter 1, in verse uh, 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. It goes on to say, And to you who were troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Notice the same time that Christ comes to be glorified in the saints 
is the same time the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. You know what the Bible says. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Our God is a consuming fire, is he not? And when he comes again, the Bible says the wicked are destroyed. Look at Revelation now, chapter 6. We have a vivid description of the wicked. In fact, it says they would rather run to the mountains and rocks to follow them rather than face Jesus and all of his glory. Look at Revelation now, chapter 6, and beginning now in verse 14. It says this, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island removed out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Don't you see how they're not ready? They're afraid, aren't they? They're ashamed. They run to get out of sight. They have rejected his salvation. They've turned their backs on his word. And they would rather die as the rocks fall on them than face Jesus and his purity and all of his holiness. And the Bible says their bodies are scattered from one end of the earth to the other end. And they're left there slain by the glory and the power of the coming of Jesus Christ. What a picture that we have at this point when Jesus comes the second time, right? What a picture. The righteous go to heaven the wicked are destroyed. Those that are already dead will remain in their graves. And people ask this question. They say, well, Brother Jason, what's going to happen to the wicked after Jesus comes? In other words, who's going to be saved? Is anybody going to be saved after Jesus comes again? I can answer that question right now without one reservation, without one. No one's going to be saved after Jesus comes. And by the way, who's going to be left to save, right? The righteous are gone. The wicked are destroyed. Who's actually left for him to actually save. There's nobody here. He, our great high priest, would have taken off his priestly garments. He no longer intercedes in behalf of humanity. The last prayer has been offered and answered. There's no more blood to be offered on our behalf. The books in heaven have closed. Look at Revelation now, chapter 22, the epilogue of this prophetic book of the Bible. It's the last chapter. And notice we find the final appeal of God. Revelation 22, beginning now in verse 10 and 11 and 12. It goes on to say this. It says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And then verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. No more saving can be done. It says right here, the righteous man remains that way, right? The wicked man remains wicked. Every case has been decided. The books in heaven have closed. Probation has now ended. And then he says in verse 12, And behold, I come what? Quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And so there's no one left to save, friends. They're all destroyed. What a picture we have. Now, you know the prophet Jeremiah gives a vivid description of the coming of Christ. In fact, this is the very verse where the Apostle Paul derives his terminology that when he comes, he comes with a shout. You know that shout is related to the lion, isn't it? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Is Jesus a king of kings and Lord of lords? Indeed, he has nothing to hide when he comes. Every eye shall see him come. The Bible says he'll blow the trumpet, give the shout. In fact, let's go to Jeremiah 25 and read it. Notice Jeremiah now, all the way back to the Old Testament once again. And we're going to look at chapter 25 in verse 30. We find in Revelation 14, incidentally, that the Bible mentions the wicked outside uh, when Jesus comes who are destroyed in, in symbolic form. They're like grapes, the wine press. You know, the wine press, when you step on grapes, it kind of splats all over the place, right? So God uses it as a metaphor to represent the destruction of the wicked. So look here in verse 30 of Jeremiah 25. It says, Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a what? A shout. You see that? He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes. 
against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Now the word nations is interesting because the Bible says in the book of Psalm 20 verse 9, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. So it's talking about the wicked inhabitants of the earth when he comes the second time. Now look at verse uh, 32. It says here, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Now isn't that plain? There's going to be nobody left is what he's saying. There's nobody left to save. And by the way, how come nobody's going to lament over the wicked? Surely the wicked would have somebody they would love or that would love them that would be bereaved over their death, right? But the Bible says they're not going to weep over them. Why, how come they're not going to weep? There's nobody here to weep over them. Surely they would have the respect to bury their loved one, but the Bible says they will not be buried. Well, how come they're not going to be buried? There's no one here to bury them. Their bodies are scattered over the earth. And this is the aftermath of the coming of Christ. In fact, let's go to Isaiah 24. And notice in Isaiah 24, we find that an earthquake is going to transpire just before Jesus comes. One we've never seen before, even to this day. Look at Isaiah chapter 24. Many call this, many theologians call this chapter, chapter 24 through verse chapter 27, Isaiah, the apocalyptics of the Old Testament. In other words, everything in Isaiah 24 through chapter 27 in seed form, in seminal form, has everything that we find in the whole book of Revelation. And it's true, it's there, but it's in seed form. So look at chapter 24 and notice verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down. And then it says, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Now drop down to verse 19. It says, the earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, it shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And so the Bible predicts this earthquake that will take place. As the earth begins to move, now you may be thinking, well, Brother Jason, how come? How come this is going to happen? How come so many people will reject Jesus and his word in the end of time when the message is so clear that God has inspired for us? Well, notice what it says here in Isaiah chapter 24. And notice here it says in verse 25, or verse 5. Let's go to verse 5. It says, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Say, does that sound familiar, friends? Doesn't the Bible say he shall think to change times and God's law? And all the world would wander and worship after the beast, the way John describes it. Isaiah says, no. He says they have broken the everlasting covenant, changed the ordinance, and they've chosen the way of man instead of the way of God. And so God gives evidence after evidence of his divine favor and his revelation of himself, but many will turn their backs on the truth. Why? Because it's simply inconvenient to follow it. Isn't that sad? In fact, it says in the book of Psalm 55, we've read it before, verse 9 and 10. It says, uh, put them in fear because they have no changes. Therefore, they will fear not God. To fear God means be willing to change and to follow the narrow way as light shines on our pathway. Now look at verse 2. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where our status is in society. It doesn't matter where we've been, where we're going. Notice what it says in verse 2. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with his, her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For the Lord has spoken his word. Friends, is it going to happen when he comes? It's going to happen. Now let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 4. Notice Jeremiah now chapter 4. And here we find another prophecy beginning in verse 19 of the coming of Christ. Notice what it says. Jeremiah 4. And we'll read here beginning in verse 19. He says, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. 
My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of what? War, the Bible says. Is he a man of war? Though he's a man of peace, is he coming in power and great glory with all the angels, the armies of heaven? Indeed. It says he's coming to smite the nations. And the nations, by definition, are made up of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet of Revelation chapter 16. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? And then God gives the answer, for my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. And then God says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was out form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. Do you see the aftershocks of the earthquake that we just read in Isaiah 24? The hills moved lightly. Now look at verse 26. Verse 25 and 26. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens fled. Well, how come there was no man? Who's left here? There's nobody left. He's taken the righteous, the wicked are destroyed. The Bible says there's no man, the birds fled. And then it goes on to say, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Has the Lord now come into the picture? Has he? And notice the modern terminology. The cities thereof were broken down at the coming of the presence of the Lord and even mentions the wicked going to the rocks and rather the rocks fall on them than face Jesus in all of his glory. Look at the next verse. It says here in verse 29, The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. When Jesus comes, that's it. He told the church in every generation, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Didn't he say that? And he says, He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Friends, we've got to endure, don't we? Every day we've got to keep our eyes focused on the prize. We're running a race and everybody can win the race if we keep our focus on Jesus Christ. And so notice when Jesus comes, we find the righteous go to heaven to be with him for the 1,000 years. We know that the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Those that have passed away remain in their graves that are wicked until at the end of the 1,000 years. Now the question is this. Everybody wants to know, well, Jason, what's going to happen to the devil and his angels? Have you thought about that before? What's going to happen to them during the millennium? Now before we get to the millennium and what's going to happen to him and his angels, let's emphasize right now briefly the time we're living in now, because what's important is to make sure that our lives correspond with the activity of Christ in heaven on our behalf. We are living in the most solemn time of earth's history. Right now, the judgment has begun, hasn't it? And Jesus is making up his kingdom right now. He's deciding who is faithful, who has accepted him, who really loves him. And as the signs are fast fulfilling before our very eyes, Jesus is solidifying his bride, He's preparing his bride for the marriage, supper of the lamb. He's going to take us to be with him. And so during this time, the devil is seeking whom he can devour because he knows he has but a short time. So he's trying to take out as many people as he can while God is seeking to save as many people as he can. But our lives must testify to the truths of God, right? We must lift up the standard. The Bible says when the enemy shall come in like a flood, it is then that the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. In our lives, what we do, what we say, how we live our lives, we must live up by God's grace to the law of God. And by his grace, we must keep his commandments. Can you say amen? The Bible says, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the perfect law of liberty. What a solemn time we're living in right now. Now we know what's happening now. We need to get ready. Have you thought about what we're going to be doing for the 1,000 years in heaven? I mean, think about it. Why do we have a time period where God designates, right, that the saints are going to be there when we know that we're going to be with Christ throughout eternity? So why the 1,000 years? Well, let's go here to the book of um, 
1 Corinthians, if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What will we be doing during the 1,000 years? And we're plainly told right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and beginning in verse 2. It says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Well, the Bible says that the saints in heaven are going to judge the world, right? They're going to judge evil angels. You see, there's records in heaven. And those records contain all the deeds of the wicked because they have not been blotted out. They have not accepted the blood of the Lamb to blot them out. Now they must face their life records. So God's going to entrust to us the work of auditing the books of records. And I tell you what, friends, I can, I can trust a God like that. What about you? I can appreciate the fact that God's going to allow us to see the end from the beginning. In other words, I have many questions for God. Do you? Think about it. I have many questions. And so as the books are open and we're going to see in heaven that there have been people that perhaps we thought surely would have been there, right? But there's more to salvation than what appears on the surface. There will be many surprises when we get to God's kingdom. And there will be people that we thought may not would ever be there. But I tell you what, God is in the ministry of saving souls, isn't he? There are people that he will save on their deathbed and they will be walking the streets of gold. You know what? I have many questions about my life. There are things that have happened to me I don't have any answers for, but you know what? I don't get discouraged, but I know that all things work together for the good to those that love the Lord. And God will disclose everything during this time and show the saints that he has done everything he possibly could to save them. We're not going to question God's goodness, but God's going to allow us to see that he did everything he could to save us. In fact, look at chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and look at verse 5. Verse 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. So clearly it says, God says, don't come to any preconceived ideas or conclusions about his goodness. When so many people will choose the broad way and be lost at last, God says in the end when the books are open and we're going to be auditing the books, he says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, right? And will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Do you realize that when we get there, we're going to see that God in his almighty providence, gentlemen, when you're on your way home from a long day at work, if it wasn't for the angels that were commissioned by our Heavenly Father to protect you, you would have died by that drunk driver. Ladies, you will, you will witness and you will see when right now it's not before your eyes because we can't see the unseen world, but angels are as real as we are today. And we will see that when we wake up in the morning, many a mother will realize if it wasn't for God's almighty providence and sending the angels to protect us and watch over us, that young child would not have been in that bassinet the next morning. Are you with me, yes or no? There will be great rejoicing and tears in heaven. In fact, the Bible says the saints will say, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, thou King of saints. So things happen that we can explain. There are trials, there are besetments, setbacks, but yet God says, don't get discouraged and don't think that I'll have your interest in view. You are the apple of my eye. And when we get to heaven and not until we get there, will God disclose everything. And I tell you, I guarantee you, we will not want it any differently than the way God set it out for us. Because even trials and pain are God's workmanship to prepare our hearts to live with him throughout eternity. Amen? In fact, do you realize the angels of God look down from heaven in amazement when they see that God has given such an abundance revelation of his will in so many people that are simply indifferent to spiritual things and eventually will be lost? Notice what it says. Look now at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. It says, For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle 
That word spectacle is the word theokros. In the Greek, it's the word theater. So the universe is what it's saying is looking on. They're, they're seeing the work of God's Spirit upon the hearts of people. They're looking on. It says, we are a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Now the word world there in the marginal reference is the word cosmos. You understand that? It's not talking about this world exclusively. It's talking about the other worlds that God has made. They're all looking on to angels, to the cosmos, and to men, which is this world. They're all looking on to see what decisions that we're making when God offers so many beautiful privileges and opportunities to follow his will. Friends, it's sad, isn't it? I mean, everyone should be saved. Don't you agree? Everyone should come into the everlasting arms of Jesus, but they're not going to do it. The Bible says they're simply not. And we're going to have questions. And God's going to allow us to have those questions answered. And we're going to see that he has done everything he possibly could to save every single soul. But people must make their own decision. We are free moral agents. He will not impose himself upon anyone. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve who? We will serve the Lord. Now, friends, what will happen to the devil and his angels during the millennium? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Let's go back to the chapter we begin with tonight. Look at Revelation 20 and beginning in verse 1. Revelation 20 and verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Now, there it is. It says he's going to be bound, right? With his angels for the millennium. With a chain, the Bible says. He's bound with a chain. Now, friends, you say, well, Jason, where is this pit that he's bound with, right? Because it says he's bound in the bottomless pit. Well, we don't have to guess at it. In fact, the word here, bottomless pit, is the Greek word abusos, which means a dark, void place. Now, this word is found in other references of the Bible. In fact, let's go to Genesis now to get an idea of what it's talking about. Notice Genesis now chapter 1. So we're going to go back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, actually. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face get this now, of the deep. And that word deep is the same word that we find in Revelation. It is the Septuagint version, but it has the same definition. It means a dark, void place. Now, when God created this world beautiful, what was it? The Bible says it was just a dark, void place, right? And he said, let there be what? Light, and he created the firmament, and of course the dry land and the trees and the grass and etc. And so the, the place was void, it was dark. Tell me something. After Jesus comes the second time, will the world be in a similar condition? In fact, what I didn't mention, I'm going to mention right now in Isaiah 13. The Bible says when Jesus comes the second time, it says the heavens are going to be moved out of their places. Did you get that? They're going to simply be moved out of their places and to think that nobody's going to see him come. Are you kidding me? Every eye will what? Will see Jesus come the second time. But notice something, the world's going to be in the very similar condition. In fact, let's go back to Isaiah 24. Look at Isaiah 24. It even mentions the word pit right here. So Isaiah 24, and we're going to drop down to verse 19. It says, The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and it shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. So Christ has come. The world has been destroyed. Look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And then it goes on to say, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the what? In the pit. You see that? 
And then it goes on to say, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days they shall be judged or visited. Now, friends, how long specifically are many days in the context here? How long will the devil be bound? For the 1,000 years, right? And notice the Bible says he's going to be bound right on this earth. Now, who are the hosts of the high ones that are on high? Because it says right there that he's going to bind the hosts of the high ones that are on high upon the earth for many days or 1,000 years. You know who they are? Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and Ephesians chapter 6? It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, wickedness in high places. It's the devil and his angels, right? They will be punished, it says, in the pit, on the earth, for many days. In other words, friends, the devil is going to be bound for the 1,000 years. Listen carefully. This world is going to be destroyed. This world, the Bible says there was no light, no man, because the heavens and the sun is moved out of their places. It's just going to be just a distant place where nothing but destruction, death, misery, and just all the above. And God is going to tell Satan, listen, you want the world? You claim to be the prince of this world. You can have it, but I'm going to take what belongs to me first before you get it. Amen? In other words, he's going to go on a 1,000-year vacation. He wants death. God's going to say, you can have it. And he's going to be on this earth for 1,000 years. Now, people always ask, now, wait a minute, because he's bound with a chain, right? Now, friends, can you bind Satan with a literal chain? Is that possible? It's impossible. In fact, look at Mark. Let's go to Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And notice what the Bible says about this man who is possessed by a demon. We're going to go to Mark. It's going to be after the book of Matthew. Mark chapter 2, I believe. No, Mark chapter 5. And we'll begin in verse 2. Notice what it says. Mark 5, verse 2. It says, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not even with what? Chains. Notice they tried to bind him with chains, and the Bible says they couldn't do it. Why? Look at verse 4. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and in chains he had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. While the Bible says that when they tried to bind him, he broke the chains as if they were made of yarn, Right? So you can't bind a spiritual being with a literal chain. Do you know what type of chain it is? It's a symbol. It is a metaphor. It is a chain of circumstances. In other words, either all the people are taken away from him or he's taken away from all the people. And do we find this to be the case during the 1,000 years? The righteous are where? They're in heaven, right? The wicked are no more. They're simply destroyed. And the devil is left by himself to reap what he has sown. And he knows that the time is coming when the fire will come down after he's judged. Don't forget, the righteous judge the wicked, don't they? They will determine. And you see, friends, that's how we know that the wicked will not burn without end. Because God will allow the righteous to judge. I want you to see that I've done everything I could to save them, but they have made the choice. And this is what's going to keep us from embracing those who are lost. Because we're going to see that they've chosen it for them to come to heaven, for them to be saved, would pollute the universe of God all over again and bring destruction, misery, and death yet again. And they will understand this, that God must bring back his strange act and destroy the wicked so God's universe could be peaceful forever and ever. Isn't that right, friends? Let's go to the book of Jude. Let's notice what the Bible says about the chains. What are the chains? The Bible calls them the chains of darkness. Look at Jude now in verse, um, verse 6. Jude in verse 6. It says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now do you understand why God has given us a 1,000 years of peace in heaven with him as we judge the wicked? Because the time is coming when all the wicked will be what? Resurrected only to face their life record. And after they're destroyed, God will recreate a new heaven and a new what? And a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Say, so you ever wonder what's gonna, what the devil is going to do for the 1,000 years? He has to roam it, right? 
You see, the earth is going to be a testament of who he is. He's death, he loves sin and death and destruction, so he's going to have to walk the earth for the 1,000 years. You know, I think he'll do a lot of thinking. What about you? I mean, you know how it is whenever we do something bad, in the aftermath of it, things start to settle in about the repercussions of our actions, about our words, and we start feeling bad, we start feeling guilty and ashamed. Well, that's the Holy Spirit, right? We should feel that way, and we should make for restitution. But at this time of the earth's history, when the devil's roaming the earth for the 1,000 years with his angels, there will be no restitution. There will be no repentance at all. He will only have to look forward to the judgment to come, for he knows that he has but a short time. I think he'll do a lot of thinking. He'll think about that man, perhaps back then, that had the drinking habit. Here was this man who wanted to do better, but he couldn't. Every time he would try to put it away, the devil was there to tempt him again and draw him back in and fall back in the gutter and go back out again. And then maybe his wife and his children loved him so much that they would clean him up and encourage him and try to put him in a program to get over it. But every time he would make a decision to do better, the devil was there. He knew his weaknesses better than he knew him. And he would be there to trip him up. And the man fell into the gutter. His family would take him back again and encourage him. And finally, this man realized his total dependence upon God to overcome. And in his agony and tears, he cries out for God to deliver him. And the power of God comes into his life. And he's free. And now he goes to be with Jesus when Jesus comes the second time. And the devil thinks about that man. Never again will he ever have another opportunity to harass that man. He's gone to be with Christ, isn't he? So he'll think about the past. And maybe some distant star may shine upon one of the carcasses that's laying down there with all the bodies, as we read, that are scattered all over the world. Maybe the devil looks at this man that's dead and his eye lights up with recognition. He recognizes the man. He lived back then. He, he was a good man. He loved his family. He was a very affluent man. He had a good job. Every day he'd come home and play with the kids. He'd give his wife attention and, of course, they were Christians, but he wasn't quite ready to really move out and give his life to the Lord fully and completely. But he really wanted to. You know, he, he had his, all his plans laid out that one day he was going to be a Christian and follow the Lord Jesus Christ and give up the world. But every time he put it off and looked for a more convenient time to do it, he'd come home and he'd see those two little girls kneeling at their bed praying for their daddy. And it just would really touch his heart. It really would. And as this man put it off and procrastinated, and looking for a better, a better time, there was the Lord Jesus Christ coming with all the angels of heaven. And this man was struck down with the wicked. And I can just imagine the face of Satan as he looks upon this man and a hideous smile comes over his face as he thinks that this man and realizes will never have another opportunity of eternal life. It is forever over for this man. And I'm telling you right now, I am not overdrawing this picture. What I'm telling you is going to happen to many people. And if we're waiting and thinking that we have a better opportunity sometime in the future, friends, we're deceiving ourselves. There's no better time to move out than today. There's no better time. Today is the day of salvation. And if we are putting it off, Make sure we don't go to bed tonight without surrendering our life to Jesus Christ and ask him to really come into our lives because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Do you realize there are many people tonight that are getting their peaceful rest that will wake up and it will be their last day in the land of the living? Isn't that true? There are people who have no idea today's their last day. They will be dead tomorrow. Every day is a gift from God. Every day is another opportunity to say, Lord, here I am and take me. I can't do it myself. I don't have the strength, but you promised that you can and you will. But I surrender my will to you. Will God do that for us, friends, if we ask? He will never turn away a prayer like that. The Bible says, them that come unto me will I in no wise cast out. He came to seek and save that which is lost. Now, what's going to happen at the end of the millennium? Have you thought about that one? What's going to happen at the very end? Let's go to Revelation now, chapter 20. Again, and here we find in Revelation chapter 20, in verse 7, notice this. 
Verse 7. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Tell me, what else happens at the end of the millennium? Remember verse 5? But the rest of the dead live not again until when? Until the thousand years are finished. So now the wicked are resurrected. The devil has somebody to go work on, doesn't he? And so he goes into the morass, the crowds that are like the sand of the sea, to marshal them there. Look at verse 8 and 9. It says, And shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, which are words used in Ezekiel to designate the wicked, the lost people. And then it says here, To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Are they numberless, friends? You can't even number them. Everyone that's ever lived that has been lost will come up instantaneously in this resurrection. Do you know what happens at the end of the millennium when the saints come down from God out of heaven? Look at chapter 21 and verse 2. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So Jesus comes in the new Jerusalem. All the saints are in the city. And it comes down from God out of heaven to the earth. And the Bible says the devil is going to go out to marshal the wicked. Do you know what I think he'll do? The Bible says he's a father of lies, isn't he? He's a liar and the father of it. He'll probably tell the wicked, hey, I resurrected you. I'm the one who has given you life again. And if you just kind of help me take over the city, it's not a little city, is it, friends? It's a large city. In fact, some historians claim with the, um, the size mentioned in Revelation that the circumference of the city, the New Jerusalem, is the circumference of the state of Oregon. That's a big city, isn't it? And so the devil thinks if he can just get into the city and eat from the tree of life, he doesn't have to die. I tell you what, in that crowd, there will probably be some great warriors we've seen on the stage of history. We don't know too much about it. Maybe they were saved at the last moment. But perhaps we'll see people like Hitler or Alexander the Great. And many of them went into their graves cursing with anger and hatred. And they'll come up in the very same way, right? And the devil thinks if he can just eat from the tree of life that he will not have to die. But no, no, the Bible tells us what's going to happen. Look at verse 9 of Revelation chapter 20. It says here, And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven. And the Bible says the fire did what? It devoured them. And by the way, this is the last phase of the battle of Armageddon. This is the final battle between good and evil. The devil is going to be with the uh, wicked on the outside of the walls. And the righteous will be on the inside with Christ. As the wicked on the outside, they perish. They'll be turned into ashes. Some will burn longer than others. But the devil and his angels will burn the longest, right? But eventually the fire is going to go out. And Jesus, with the privilege of the righteous to behold it, will look out the city and he will speak and recreate a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And the Bible says he'll dwell among men. The new center of the universe, it says in Revelation, will be right on the new earth. It says God will dwell among men. How about that one, right? You talk about joy and a privilege. We get to live with God on the new earth. It's going to be amazing. And the Bible says there'll be no need of the sun for the lamb will be the light thereof. Happy ever after. Righteousness will reign throughout the universe. No more sin, no more sinners, only those that have been redeemed. And we will behold the very marks of his oppression and his death throughout the ceaseless ages. And it will be a forever reminder of what has been paid for our redemption and the joy that we'll have with Jesus throughout the ceaseless ages, friends. What a beautiful promise, amen, that God has indeed given us. Now, I want you to come with me now to the book of Revelation chapter 21. You know, within the last 20 or 30 years, maybe a little longer, we've seen some strange developments in the world, haven't we? And many of you remember that in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, some very famous walls began to tear down over in Western Europe. Democracies begin to be set up. Dictatorships begin to crumble. And that just soon may happen here in the near future as well, if you know what I'm talking about in the present condition of this world. But notice Revelation chapter 21 in verse 10. This describes the new Jerusalem. And notice what it says about the walls of the city. 
Look at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Try to imagine this. The new Jerusalem has walls that are transparent. You can look right through. You can see right through them. And I've tried to imagine the impact this will have upon the wicked when they're on the outside of the walls and they're looking through and they realize what they've given up and how they've given it up. Imagine the man that, that lost his life who had the two little girls we talked about a moment ago. Here he is now. He comes up in the second resurrection only to hear the cursing of Satan and the angels as they gather the lost against God's holy city. Maybe he's looking for his wife and his two little girls. He can't find them anywhere. And as he gets closer and closer to the city, he looks through those transparent walls and beyond the walls are the angels of God moving to and fro. There is the tree of life and the river of life. Jesus is so transparent. He's so glorious. Everybody's simply transfixed as they looked upon his loveliness. And then all the thoughts that go through his mind as he thinks, what a fool I was not to make my decision when I could have made it. And the emotions start coming. And he gets a little closer and he looks beyond the walls and he sees that beautiful tree of life, the fruit hanging off of it, the river of life. There's no words to describe the amount of glory and beauty that he will see. And maybe beyond the walls, he sees some forms getting closer from the inside. And his eye lights up with recognition as baby perhaps he recognizes his own wife and his two little girls. And he cries out to them to recognize who he is and to pray for him just one more time. And then the thoughts just rush to his mind as he remembers the final time he said no. He wasn't going to move out and make that decision. And then his voice bounces off the wall. He falls to the ground realizing that he's eternally lost. He can't even be with his family anymore as he's there screaming, crying, and rolling for just one more chance. They don't never have again. It is over for him. It has been my work in traveling for the last 15 years to listen to people tell me why they simply do not want to make a decision for truth. I have been in people's homes. I've had people tell me. I've had people say, Brother Jason, listen. If I truly follow what I know is right, I've had pastors of churches coming to my meetings under great conviction telling me it's true, it's right, but if I followed the law, if I kept God's commandments, my family would think I lost my mind. They tell me. They would think I'm crazy if I kept the fourth commandment, if I kept the Sabbath, for example. Listen, friends. Yes, maybe, just maybe, our friends and our family and even our own church may object. If we step out boldly and keep God's commandments, but here's my question. What good will these people do us if we're on the outside of the walls? Isn't that right? Sometimes people say, I don't want to be there. It doesn't matter what we want. Are we all going to be there that day on the inside or the out? We're all going to look through the wall, aren't we? One day we're all going to meet again. And my question is, what good will these people do us? What good will the majority do if we have made the choice to put man over God and we're on the outside of the walls. I've had people tell me, listen, if I followed the Lord, and once again, back to the commandment that many, that the enemy has changed and the, the Antichrist has substituted, the one that God has given to show that he's the creator. I've had people say, if I truly stepped out and obeyed that and kept that commandment, I'd lose my job. And Jason, I can't afford to lose that money. Don't you understand? Let me tell you something tonight. Listen carefully and don't miss it. You could have the billions of Bill Gates you could have the millions of the Rockefellers right beside you in a great heaping mound if it were possible. But what good will all that money do us if we're on the outside of the walls? What did Jesus say? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? It won't do you any good when we're on the outside, right? Do you realize that when this day comes, that Ezekiel is the foundation for Revelation 20. And it says that there will be children and parents tearing each other apart because our loved ones, the Bible says a man's foes will be those of his own household. Did you know that? When this day comes, those that are not committed 
will try to trip up those in their family that are committed. And he says that when this time comes and they wake up and realize it's forever too late, they will tear each other apart because these people discouraged them from following what was right. In fact, it says in Ezekiel that the pastors and the leaders whom God has committed to their care, the precious sheep of the earth, because of popularity, because of means, they have turned their back on the truth and the sheep have perished. And the Bible says they will rush for these ministers because they were the ones that misled them. There'll be bloodshed on the outside of those walls before the fire comes down. But let me tell you, I've made my decision. I'm a sinner. I'm weak. I have my struggles, but I've made my choice. You understand that? I'm going to be on the inside. What about you? I've made my choice. I'm going to be on the inside. I don't want to be on the outside. I don't want that. Who wants that, right? I want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. God leads us by his word. You understand that tonight by his spirit, but the spirit always speaks in perfect harmony with the written word. So you can't believe your emotions, your feelings, and what everybody else is telling you, what they believe. You must follow the word of God alone, and that will save you. How many of you here tonight want to say with me, Lord, give me the love that I need for you. Do that work that's necessary, that I can have that faith that works by love, that purifies the soul. Because, Lord, I want to be in heaven. I want to be in the city of God. I want to be with you throughout eternity. And if it means that I must keep your commandments by your grace, then so be it. If you love me, do what? And keep my commandments. Is that your desire tonight? Let me see your hands. Praise God. Can we pray together? Let's close. Father in heaven, what a solemn revelation. So much more that we could study tonight. The time has run out. But there's enough to know that there's a place for everybody in this room in your city. It's not too small. You have given your son so that we can have a place. And I pray, I plead with my heart tonight that everyone here will make that decision that's necessary to be there in that day on the inside. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.